I'm feeling a bit fragile this morning. Uh, a couple of days ago, I bruised my ribs quite badly. And um, Friday night, I was <laughs> so, so painful, I thought, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do Sunday. Well, it's often happened like that. I'm down to speak somewhere, and uh, something happens. And I think God's saying, well, you know, don't rely on yourself, rely on me. And uh, it works out, and praise God. So um, this morning, I want to talk about... Um, the lost coin, the lost coin, yeah, in Luke 15, we have three parables about things that are lost and found, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, better known as the prodigal son. I want to talk particularly about the lost coin today, because we often hear about the lost sheep, we often hear about the prodigal son, don't often hear about the lost coin. Uh, now, the context in which Jesus tells these stories as expressed in these terms. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around him, that's around Jesus, to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And uh, to counteract that, Jesus tells these parables to explain his mission. Now, you remember the parable about the lost sheep. There were a hundred, but one was lost. And in the parable the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes after the one which was lost. The summary which Jesus gives at the end of the section is, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Equally, everyone will be familiar with the parable of the lost son. In the story, he's one of two brothers. He wants to have a good time. He doesn't want to wait for his father to die to get his inheritance. His father is generous, gives the money to his son who goes and spends it all. Hence the word prodigal. Prodigal means spendthrift, okay? Some people think prodigal means lost. But anyway, but anyway, he's prodigal, but he's lost. And he comes back and the gracious father welcomes him back with open arms. And the older brother is not happy, as you might expect, but... Jesus summarizes the parable with these words of the Father, we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now in between these two parables, there's the lost coin. It's the shortest of the three. And it's often neglected because, well, what can you say about this? It's, you know, it's a lot more in the, you know, the lost sheep and the lost son, but there we are. We'll just read what it says, say, Luke 15, 8 to 10. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, it's obvious these three parables go together. There's a certain symmetry to it. The numbers go down from one in a hundred to one in ten to one of two. The lost things are varied. There's an animal, sheep. There's an inanimate object, a coin. And there's a human being, a son. Uh, some people have seen, you know, the, the work of the Trinity in these three parables. I'm not sure if that quite works. But obviously the father in the prodigal son represents the father. Jesus is portrayed as the good shepherd, uh, which leaves the Holy Spirit like the woman looking for a coin. Not sure if that really works. But anyway. <laughs> well, I'm, some people are like that, and, uh, you know, fair enough. But the reasons for these things being lost is different in each case. The sheep is just following its instinct to find food. It's careless as to its own well-being. The coin is lost, I suppose, because of the inattention of the woman. She's, she's lost it. Um, and the prodigal son, well, he just deliberately follows his own selfish and willf willful desires, and so he ends up being lost. Now, the reason for the parables is to be found in those two verses which I read uh, at the outset, that Jesus was associating with notoriously bad people, those who were rejected by society, and he was criticized for this by the religious people. And Jesus wants to make the point that his mission is to save those who are lost, those who are outcast, those who are needy, those who are regarded as being outside the pale. 
And not only does he want to save them, but he says that when they're saved and found, there's rejoicing in heaven. Heaven is, is rejoicing over this. There's a celebration. There's a party. It's not that God grudgingly accepts them back. He's over the moon about it. So anyway, let's look at this second par- parable. Here's a domestic scene. Jesus always wanted to relate to people in the situations they were familiar with. This woman has ten pieces of silver, ten coins. The word used is a drachma. It's of not great value. It's the equivalent of a day's pay for a labourer. Let's say 100 quid. Maybe I'm a bit out of date, but anyway. She has ten of these. Some people have suggested that it was... uh, one of ten coins worn as a headdress, a sort of dowry, each attached by a thread through a hole pierced in the coin. The evidence for this is rather sketchy, and I have difficulty in understanding how you could lose just one of them. I mean, you know, it breaks, you lose them all, wouldn't you? Or at least, uh, or maybe they all fell down. And anyway, she's lost one of these, uh, one of these coins. But who knows? It may have been the money she needed to for them to survive for the month. It may have been their rent to pay. I don't know. Um, In any event, she's become aware that one is missing. Now, what can we say about this coin? Well, this coin has been made of precious metal and it's stamped with an image. And in this respect, I think it's like all of mankind. God has created us in his image. He breathed his breath of life into mankind and transformed a collection of chemicals into a living being. Now, all are precious to God because he made us. We are his creation. Psalm 145 says this, The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving to all he has made. Sorry, that's three different verses from that one psalm. They don't all come together. (laughs) that same psalm. So we must never lose sight of the fact that God is our creator. And this is why the idea of evolution is such an attack not only on God himself but on man who is made in the image of God. That's why mankind is so diminished when this truth is attacked and I think that there can be no compromise with it. It's not scientific, it's a tool of atheism And Christians who compromise with it do great damage to our cause. Now, obviously, it's difficult to talk about the detail of that in sort of a congregation, some of whom might not be interested at all. But if you want to know more, come and talk to me and see where the science really lies. And since the discovery of DNA and the amazing complexity of the living cell, it's been obvious to all that the creation of life from lifeless chemicals by pure chance, is a scientific impossibility. That's well documented. The whole of creation displays the workmanship of our creator. And this is why everyone matters to God. Everyone matters to him. This is why Jesus came to die for our sins, and not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. You know, we sing that song, heaven, he did not want heaven without us, so he brought heaven down. That's true. You see, Jesus came to be a man because he wanted to save mankind from their sins. Now note that the coin had value even when it was lost. Still the same coin, still bore the image of its maker even when hidden from sight. Still belonged to the woman and to the other coins even when separated. It couldn't be written off simply because it wasn't being used. Its value wasn't being used properly. And so it is with lost people today. They may be doing evil, they may be good, or just indifferent, or hostile to God. But God wants them. He wants their value to be used and appreciated. He wants to use human beings for his purposes. He hasn't written us off. He hasn't written off mankind. He could have done. They may be lying in the dust and dirt, but God sees them where they are. Many people feel lost, but they can't really explain this lostness. If they had any... You know, the coin, if it had any power to reflect, you know, might have wondered about the, the crowned head that was stamped on it, the image. It may have wondered how its value could be spent 
What's the value? What's the use of being made of silver if I'm trodden down in the floor just like the dirt and the dust? Surely I was made for something better than this. But now I was once bright and shiny, but my face has become clouded with the dust. I've taken on the dustiness of my surroundings. And a person only begins really to understand their lostness when they learn about their owner who is looking for them. And there's another angle to this. I've talked about the value of mankind as a whole to God. But God knows who will respond to his invitation and to his searching. And this is a mystery, really. It's the mystery of God's foreknowledge and election. Who pretends to understand this? You know, when you understand what it means to have infinite knowledge, then you will understand that. My position has long been to, to give to all of Scripture its true value, wherever you read it, wherever you find it. Theologians try to fit everything into their particular box. And the danger in doing that, of course, is that you, you emphasize some things and then you dismiss others. You know, and other people who emphasize those, those things then dismiss the other things that don't quite fit their, into their box. Well, I think we need to give value to the whole of Scripture. And there is a sense in which you know, though Jesus died for the whole world, there will only be a certain number who will respond to that call and God knows who they are. Even now he knows all of them who will ever be. <clears throat> so in this sense, we're looking for the people that the Lord already knows about, just like Jesus was looking for people of faith. I mean, that's an amazing thing. He was, he was very happy when he found a little bit of faith, you know. You remember the centurion who, who knew about authority and command, and he had faith to know that Jesus had authority in the spiritual realm. He had to just give a word, just like he, him, he himself as a soldier just had to give a command, and it was done. Jesus said of him, I not found faith like that in all of Israel. And Jesus was very happy about that. And people who are prepared to risk um, abuse or loss of reputation in coming to him, Jesus would often confirm their faith by saying something like this, you know, your, your faith has healed you, your faith has saved you. So the value of those we are seeking is increased by the fact that God already knows about them. We're, we are looking. <clears throat> so the fact that, Jesus, that God regards people as having value means that we should too. Jesus is teaching us what God is like, He's not writing off the lost and the rebellious and the negligent like the Pharisees would. He's self-sacrificing like the shepherd. He's patient like the father of, of the prodigal son. And he's diligent in his search like the woman. And if we're to be like him, we should display these qualities as well. So what does the woman do in the parable? Well, <clears throat> here I remind you, of course, the parables are stories. They're not history uh, there are no other details to be discovered, like you might with the history. You find another source, and you find more about the history. What is told is all you get, okay? Um, and if we have further suggestions to make, filling in gaps, that's our imagination. It has to fit with the rest of Scripture, but it is, to some extent, imagination. But I think it's legitimate to do that. But there are certain things that the woman does. There are three things she does. One is, she lights a lamp. The problem is her house is dark. Before the use of glass became widespread, it existed, but not for ordinary people, uh, windows were small because that meant less heat to come in when it was cold, and less cold to come in when you needed to be warm, and uh, it's a small area to secure, you know, to stop thieves coming in. Somebody, someone has suggested that, well, it was night time, but I wouldn't have thought that the woman would have immediately, on discovering she'd lost something, got up in the night. But anyway, no, I think that uh, there would have been enough light in the daytime from the outside to go about most chores, but to look for a lost coin, you need a lamp. And there were dark corners and a certain amount of clutter. And we live in a dark world where many things come to obscure the face of God. The light would have been reflected on the coin once it was discovered and 
would have brought it to the attention of the woman, the seeker. So, what does the lamp represent? What does the light represent? Well, here are a few things. The word of God is the main one. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Another thing is the truth of the gospel is a light. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, The God of this age has blinded the, eye, the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So the light of the gospel. God's favour. Psalm 4.6 Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. And finally, God's people. Matthew 5.14 You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. <laughs> Thanks, am I getting a bit hoarse? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Problem is, when you've got oh, a pain in the ribs, you can't bend down very far. Cheers. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So light. The first thing to do to reach the lost is to present the word of God, the gospel revealed in it, that Jesus came to earth to save sinners and he achieved that by his death on the cross. So that anyone who believes is saved, that's light. That will shine into dark places. And if we're full of God's word, we will be full of light. If we're full of the gospel, we will be full of light. So don't cover up God's word. Don't filter it. Don't think, well, what would be acceptable to this person? The biggest danger, of course, to say what you think people will like to hear. There are people that do that. They say to you what you th they think you'll like to hear. Um, it's not a good principle, really, um, for life in general, but certainly not when, with the... Uh, presenting the gospel to people so we're not judges of the, of the Bible, the Bible judges us and we need to give it all its true weight and Paul was quite upfront about this when he says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17 to 25 that he was sent to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. And it's true, the gospel has power. We need to believe in its power. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. So the only light which will reveal those whom God is seeking is that of the gospel, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Second thing that she does in this parable she swept the house now it would have taken a certain amount of uh, effort and tidying up it would have raised a certain amount of dust uh, there was certainly more dust than coin uh, on the earth floor of this Middle Eastern house there had to be some disturbance the dust would not have been very happy at being disturbed before it settled down to its place again. So it is with the gospel. And when the gospel is preached, it raises a certain amount of dust to bring to light the odd coin here and there. And to take another picture from a different parable of Jesus, we need to cast our net wide and it will draw in the good and the bad. Sometimes we find a person who seems to be interested and we, then we pour all our effort into that person and we're you know, spending lots and lots of time you know, 
weeks and weeks, years sometimes. But we may have to present the gospel to many people before we find one coin, one, one person who is going to belong to the Lord. So we need to be prepared to raise a bit of dust. Okay? We need to be prepared to disturb. We need to challenge people in their comfort. Because we know that it is a false comfort, it is a deceptive comfort, if they are ignoring God, neglecting him, thinking, oh, well, everything will, will, um, will be all right in the end. And I don't agree with those who say, well, we shouldn't upset people, you know, with challenging them about salvation and, and that sort of thing. Shouldn't threaten people. Any of you heard that? Um, they say. But look at the example of Jesus and the apostles. They didn't go around sort of, you know, making sure people were left in their comfort zone. They told the truth. Now, the truth offends, but we must proclaim it. Now, in our Thursday Bible study, we've been looking at Paul's second letter to the, the church in Corinth, in which he says that the opposition and persecution which he had received was the mark of true apostleship. That was his badge of apostleship because he suffered all these things. You see, the church in Corinth had come under the influence of some people, um, some self-proclaimed apostles who were very eloquent and rather dismissive of Paul. And uh, reading between the lines, um, there's a suggestion that maybe this Paul had somehow brought all that stuff on himself. He must have, he must have rubbed people up the wrong way, you know. Um, but as, as Paul points out, the church in Corinth would not have existed if he hadn't gone to preach there. And so they could take that to those, those new pseudo-apostles. Um, and he got, he got there. He spent a year and a half there. Read the account in Acts. And while he was there, it was difficult. It was hard going. He needed encouragement. There was a lot of opposition. And the encouragement he got, the Lord appears to him in a dream and says, Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. See, God knew in advance. See, God knows everything. And he, he knows the end from the beginning. He knew that there would be a number of people, and a number of people did come to him in the city of Corinth. So we have to stir up the dust. We have to sweep. We have to disturb. Third thing that she does, she searched carefully. <clears throat> And God is searching for the lost. But you say, well, he knows everything. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't have to search like we say. He knows, you know, where, where they are. But that's true. But he mainly uses people like you and me. And he wants to use us to find these people. And God may be trying to tell you where a particular lost coin is. Um, but we hear God imperfectly, I think. And we, we don't often hear. And I'm, I'm greatly impressed by people that, uh, who um, have been able to really link into God's guidance in their evangelism and sort of reaching out, you know, some of our missionary people that we're supporting and praying for have uh, been able to do that. So we should be careful seekers like this woman and not be satisfied until we find the lost so finally, like in the other parables, when the coin is found, there's joy. The woman calls her friends and neighbors together. I've tried to put myself into this situation to understand what sort of celebration this is. It's not quite like the prodigal son and the, the fatted calf, is it? It's not, um, okay, she's lost and found 100 quid. Um, it's, it's not nothing, but it's, you know, if she hadn't found it, it wouldn't have been the end of the world. Um, that's why I think some commentators have suggested that these, this collection of coins had some sentimental significance and a bit like losing your wedding ring or something like that. I don't know. Um, there we are. But because it was lost, she was short and um, uh, there would be trouble in some way, I, I suspect. Um, but there again, this is my reading between the lines. It's not there in the story. We just don't know. It's just a story. But I think we have to learn from these things. So she's mentioned this to her friends and neighbours, and she might say, "Look, I've lost, I've lost one of these. I've lost, you know, one of my 
Uh, I've lost this money, I've lost this coin. There's only one coin, but it's, good. it's worth a day's pay. Um, and I've, I, I had this put aside for something, maybe, you know, maybe it's a savings, I don't know. But anyway, pray with me. But anyway, when she finds it, she goes back, she says, well, I found it. Thank you, thank you for praying, all of you, and I found it. And so Jesus says, if that's what ordinary people do when they find a lost sheep, a lost coin, and lost sons, how much more will our Heavenly Father and the angels rejoice when people who are lost, who are without him, are found? So this makes it clear, as God himself is rejoicing, this is not just an angel thing, the angels just take their cue from God. So God is happy. So let's join with, with him in his joy. And uh, we, we just praise God for all those who come to know him and declare that they want to follow him in baptism. Praise God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, make us uh, like the, the people in these parables, and particularly this woman who is searching for the lost. Lord, we know that you have a, a purpose for calling us, for finding us, and that purpose is to find others. So, Lord, may we be careful and diligent searchers, not willing to to just let things lie. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.